What is going on everybody? Welcome to the reveal of number 18 in my power rankings, a deep dive into the Arizona Cardinals. And now for the second year in a row, I am seemingly higher on this Cardinals team than everyone else. NFL has them like 27th, ESPN in the mid 20s as well. So I had them 15th last year. I was encouraging people to not forget about this team and did you know that this team actually went 8-8 eight and eight last year despite losing David Johnson right out the gate, losing Carson Palmer in Week 7? This team was still competitive and won 8 games. They actually met their over-under of 8, which was one of my favorite bets last year to go over, which I had written off, honestly, after those injuries. I counted that as a wash, but this was still a very competitive team. But that said, this is very much a new-look team. Obviously, the biggest part being the new head coach and the retirement of Bruce Arians, who has been one of the better coaches in this league for the last five years or so. But they do bring in Steve Wilkes, who has a good defensive mind. They're going to change up this defensive scheme that we'll talk about why this defense could actually take a, another step up with this new scheme. I think it is much better suited for their players. And then you got, of course, the new quarterback situation. So we've got a lot to talk about here. Overall, we're going to see that this is yet another very competitive NFC team, a team that I am higher on, and then we will get into the schedule after we break everything down positionally and talk about what my expectations are and how many wins we could be talking about for this team. So offensively, they come in at 22nd, so I'm not expecting this to be some crazy offense. Starting off with the quarterback position, though, I do actually see this year as an upgrade to the quarterback room. And it's not so much that I didn't like Carson Palmer, it's more the fact that Carson Palmer barely played last year and this team really survived despite having terrible quarterback play last year. You know, Blaine Gabbert, Drew Stanton, it was rough. And with the surrounding core here, they certainly were not prepared uh, to roll out those guys. So it's a fully new quarterback room. You've got Sam Bradford here, who, when healthy, in my opinion, is still a top 16 quarterback or so, can still command the ball around the entire field, has a very good arm, and is extremely accurate. Now, his mobility is some of the worst in the NFL, and obviously the biggest problem with Sam Bradford has been health. But the nicest thing here about this Cardinals team, and this is going to be the resounding reason why I am a little higher on this team, is you are essentially guaranteeing your team is going to have quality quarterback play, at least starting caliber quarterback play, because you have Josh Rosen here now. And it's going to be Sam Bradford's team to start. And if he stays healthy, that's fantastic. They get a pretty solid quarterback there. But if and when Sam Bradford does get hurt, you know, not a whole lot of cartilage left in those knees, I am a believer in Josh Rosen. thought he was one of the best picks in this draft. And he gets the great opportunity here to sit and learn you know, in an ideal world, Bradford finishes the year and then they can hand the keys to Rosen. But, you know, odds are something's going to happen to Bradford and we're going to see Josh Rosen. And as far as Rosen's future is concerned and how I project him as a franchise quarterback here, you know, I see him as a Matt Ryan, Jared Goff. I break down my five elite traits and, you know, he doesn't have a sea ball hit ball arm, I don't think, you know, where he can put the ball at any place on the field, no matter what position his body is in or where he is in the pocket. He could develop traits two through four, which are all about accuracy and pre-snap, post-snap play recognition. And then he's not going to be this elite mobile guy and extend plays with his feet, but he could extend plays with his mind inside the pocket, do a little things like that. So I really do see him as a Matt Ryan, Jared Goff, really high-end system quarterback down the road. People don't like his personality. They think he's arrogant. Every time I listen to him talk, I buy in more and more. I think professional football players are going to like his confidence. And, you know, he, he knows that he's smarter than anyone in that room. Might rub some people the wrong way, but man, uh, I want my quarterbacks to be smart. So for those reasons, they come in at 22nd at quarterback getting a much needed boost from what they had from the position last season. You also have Mike Glennon here, who if in the worst case scenario, they don't feel Josh Rosen is ready, they can go to Mike Glennon. It's still probably an upgrade from what they had last year, but obviously the expectations drop off if that becomes the case. 
So then we move on and talk about the rest of this offense. Now, this is not the 2015 Cardinals that had a bunch of explosive receivers and was a high-flying offense. Certainly a new-look team, but you do have the return of David Johnson, who alone really gives this offense an identity and makes them serviceable. You know, unlike most running backs where at some point you still need a good offensive line, what David Johnson offers as a receiver can transcend that. And you really have so many ways to get this man the ball. He is fast, great in space, versatile. So they do come in third for running back. That said, I do think David Johnson is the second best running back in the league. I just like the depth of the Rams who come in ahead of them as I'm higher on John Kelly. And you talk about the depth here, you know, it can't be all David Johnson. You do need to relieve him at some point. Also keep in mind, we're talking about one point between the Rams and the Cardinals. So please don't focus in on that. But you got probably Chase Edmonds here. The fourth round pick is going to be the relief pitcher, so to speak here. He is pretty good out of the backfield, catching the ball. Very shifty dude coming from a lower level of competition. So a high upside guy there in Chase Edmonds. We'll see how that all plays out. Uh, but I am concerned about who's running between the tackles here because uh, I don't see Edmonds as a very good between the tackles runner. You got TJ Logan, a fifth round pick from last year. Don't really think very highly of him. You got DJ Foster and Elijah Penny, who just might be a fullback here. So the depth is pretty poor and this could be a decent fit as well for DeMarco Murray. Murray offers a lot of the same things that David Johnson can do in terms of his flexibility. Murray very underrated as a receiver. So keep an eye on that. I could absolutely see this being a landing spot for DeMarco Murray. This Cardinals team has shown that they like to bring in a veteran as we near the season. We saw uh, Chris Johnson in the past. So as long as you got David Johnson, you are going to be able to run the ball here at least somewhat, and he's going to contribute greatly in the past game and really help out uh, these quarterbacks, particularly if it is Josh Rosen. Always nice to have that check down guy that can turn what most running backs would have as a one or two yard gain into, you know, five, 10, 50 yard plays. That's what you get with David Johnson. Then let's talk about the rest of the weapons here. You can start with Larry Fitzgerald. Uh, people think I hate Larry Fitzgerald. I mean, come on. I do not hate Larry Fitzgerald. Five, six years ago, this guy was right there with the best receivers in the league. His career is incredible. One of the best receivers of all time, but he's not what he used to be. The, the Cardinals recognized that he was not creating the same type of separation, but he is still incredible in contested ball situations, catching the ball through contact and run blocking. So he has converted to essentially what you get from like a slot tight end, like a Zach Ertz, Jordan Reed. He plays closer to the line of scrimmage than any quote unquote wide receiver in the entire league. Nice thing about Larry Fitzgerald, uh, as opposed to guys like Golden Tate or Jarvis Landry, who I think you're really splitting hairs between those three if you're debating the best slot receiver in the league, though I do lean Jarvis Landry. You know, Larry Fitzgerald can run a deep out, he can run up the seam, and you can throw him a jump ball and he's more than likely gonna win that. You know, he's not jumping over anyone, but he still has elite hands and elite ball tracking skills. So he is still a very good weapon here, even if I'm not ranking him as a true number one receiver. And he's gonna be, as far as Josh Rosen's development goes, you know, you almost hope that Rosen does get in this year because we don't know if Larry is gonna come back for another year after this. And a guy like Larry in the slot, in those shorter routes, is going to be a great buddy for a rookie quarterback. So it could really help Rosen get comfortable in this league. And then you look at the other guys here. Keep an eye on Chad Williams, a receiver that few people out of Arizona are aware of, but he is a third round pick from last year. Prototype number one type of athlete. Barely saw the field last year, only 98 reps. But with the departure of John Brown and Jerron Brown, the opportunity is now really here for Chad Williams to emerge as a potential number one receiver in this league. He has that type of upside. Obviously, a ways to go, but definitely one of the bigger under the radar guys on this team that you're going to want to know about. And then you also got Christian Kirk here, and this is going to be an interesting year for Kirk because he really projected as a slot receiver, a guy I really like. My pre-draft comp for him was Randall Cobb, but with Larry Fitzgerald here, also, Ricky Seals-Jones as the tight end. Kirk's not going to have any room to play in the slot where he is best. So it'll be interesting to see 
how he translates as an outside receiver. Now, if you look at uh, his college tape on the outside, it's not bad. So while his physical skill set suggests he should be playing in the slot, he could very well get an opportunity on the outside here, or we simply see him as the fourth guy here getting minimal reps. If he can't beat out Chad Williams or JJ Nelson, who I'll talk about in a second, you know, maybe he just sits and develops and is a seamless transition uh, over Larry Fitzgerald once Larry Fitzgerald is on his way. And that's actually a pretty similar career path to what Randall Cobb had, who came into a very crowded green base uh, group of receivers. So then you do have JJ Nelson here. I don't mean to bring him up last because I actually, uh, I think I'm much higher on JJ Nelson than a lot of people. Had heard some things about him really being an elite separator that his release was underrated and that he had better ball tracking skills than anyone ever imagined. So I dialed up a few games focused in on JJ Nelson and I'm buying into him as a very good deep threat in this league. He did in fact lead the league in separation on deep targets, I believe 20 yards or more. And he does show very good hands, ability to, you know, tap the feet, track the ball, all that. Now he doesn't have a height advantage over anyone, but this is going to sound crazy, but to me, the difference between a J.J. Nelson and Brandon Cooks is very slim. And I'm much lower on Brandon Cooks than a lot of people. You know, I think everything that J.J. Nelson does, Brandon Cooks does maybe 10, 15% better. But when you're talking about J.J. Nelson here playing on a fifth round rookie contract and Brandon Cooks looking to be playing for about 16, 17 million dollars, that definitely does not equate the uh, playing difference that you get between those two. And the way I'm speaking about J.J. Nelson here is projecting a little extra growth here with a more stable quarterback situation. So between Nelson, Williams, and Kirk, you've got some young guys here that I think make this wide receiving core a little bit underrated. You know, it's, it's nothing crazy. They do come in tied with three other teams for 26th, but there are some weapons here. Also watch the development of Ricky Seals-Jones, more of a receiver than a tight end, but when he got opportunities, especially late in the year, started to show some flashes. I imagine that's a player that Cardinals fans are really excited to watch this year. So then you get to this offensive line. It's not pretty. They come in tied with three other teams for 25th. You know, it should be better, theoretically. So DJ Humphreys, who battled injuries last year, you know, got hurt right away, tried to come back, and then got hurt again. Uh, he actually graded out all right against the run. You know, we're talking about a former first round pick here. So this team is really relying on DJ Humphreys and he's gonna be a pretty big pivotal point for how good this team can be. You know, if DJ Humphreys can come out and show in his fourth season now that he's a starting caliber left tackle and become more consistent uh, protecting the quarterback, that could be a serious upgrade to the scope of this offense, especially when you look at the lack of mobility from their quarterbacks. So outside of Humphreys, you know, the guards here are pretty solid. You got Mike Upati, and they signed Justin Pugh, which was a really good signing. Upati's had a falling off, definitely nearing the end of his career here, but still a solid guard. You got AQ Shipley, the veteran there at center. So you could do worse as far as the interior is concerned. They do take Cole Madison as well, versatile dude. Lineman I really liked out of Michigan. You know, get yourself a Big Ten lineman, everybody. Maybe the only conference left teaching fundamental offensive line play at the college level these days. But then right tackle is going to be a problem. Andre Smith is not an answer at right tackle. You do have Will Holden. Corey Cunningham is a seventh round pick. I'm sure they'll have an open competition there, but I don't think either of those young players are going to beat out Andre Smith, the veteran. You know, Smith still very strong, still a massive human being. If this team is running the ball, he's going to look okay. But when this team gets behind and, and opposing pass rushers get to pin their ears back, they're going to be targeting Andre Smith, probably the worst starter uh, of this entire offense. So again, they come in 22nd. We'll see how this offensive line plays out. They could definitely boost this. We'll see what Josh Rosen turns into and these receivers. There is a decent chunk of upside here, but a lot of stuff that's got to come together. So then defensively, I already mentioned the changing of the guard with the coach and the scheme. So this team is switching from a complex sort of multiple 3-3-5, three, 3-4 three, three, defense to a much more simplified 4-3 Carolina Panthers style defense under Coach Wilkes. And this defense that I rank 11th, while as we'll see is pretty thin, I think is personnel wise much better suited for the 4-3 scheme. So we'll start with the pass rush here. And you got Chandler Jones, should plug in 
right in as a top 10 pass rusher yet again this year. Always a little easier to play defense when you got a guy like him getting after the quarterback. And then on the other side, you got Marcus Golden. Showed a lot of flashes as a young player. Got hurt last year, so another really crippling injury for this team last year. And he's got to stay healthy because the depth behind these two, Benson Maioa, and then really just a bunch of undrafted free agents, it gets pretty ugly at that important edge rush position. So if they can stay healthy, this is a very good edge rush. They do come in at 11th. Again, any injuries would be very problematic here, but I do like what this edge rush is going to do to help out this defense. And then on the interior, you got a bunch of guys that played pretty well last year, pretty quietly. Corey Peters, Olsen Pierre, Rodney Gunter, and then you got Robert Kandichi, obviously that super high ceiling, former number one high school prospect, making the transition here to a 4-3-D tackle. Crazy upside, but has given us no reason to think that he can have any sort of off-field preparation, consistency, any of that kind of thing that would make him the type of defender that he could be. So we'll see if a new scheme, a new coach can get things going for him. So while it's a good group of interior guys, really no studs or stars in there. And then these linebackers we'll talk about in a second, really not doing a whole lot in terms of run defense. So, you know, if this defense is going to struggle, it will be against the run. They do rank 25th for me. And then you get to these linebackers and this gets really interesting because really hard to define what these guys roles were in that last defense. You got Dion Buchanan, sort of the evolutionary safety transition to linebacker sort of changed the league and was really good off the bat but the more and more he had to play inside the trenches as a middle linebacker in between the tackles he started to get exposed but now in this 4-3 scheme he is primarily going to be lining up outside of the tackles or at least head up on the tackle which means much less thumping in the trenches and much more open space to show off that pursuit and speed in space. So he very well in this new scheme fit should take a jump forward back to kind of that stud defender he was not too long ago. Very similar player to Shaq Thompson who had a lot of success in this same scheme. And then you also have Hassan Reddick who gets really interesting as well. Last year as a rookie, really had a hard time grasping this defense. Uh, at times they had him playing middle linebacker, they had him lined up as an edge rusher at times as that sort of outside linebacker in coverage off ball. You know, he was really moving all over the place and struggled. But a lot of people loved Hassan Reddick coming out of the draft. Some people thought he was a steal when they took him. Crazy physical upside. Reminds me a good bit of Anthony Barr in terms of his physical profile and just who he is as a player in that he can blitz very efficiently, as an off-ball linebacker, but can also show off some really good ability in coverage, closing space very quickly in those short to intermediate routes. So he will be able to get to do all of those strengths, much more so as a 4-3 linebacker. And then they do have Josh Bynes here, Scooby Wright. These guys are going to be sort of the first and second down interior middle linebacker. We'll see who wins that job. I don't think it makes too big of a difference. Overall, they do come in for 20th, but I really think you're going to get higher level play from Reddick and Buchanan in this new scheme. And then you look at the secondary. This is still a very good secondary despite losing Tyron Matthew. And he had some concerns as the offseason got started because they let Tremont Williams go as well, who was under the radar, one of the 20 or 30 best corners in the league, and was a big part of this defense last year. But they made some nice additions. They get Christian Campbell, who I thought was an absolute steal in the sixth round. We'll see how he plays out or if he even ends up starting here because you do have Jamar Taylor, who this team traded for after the draft. Taylor is kind of the odd man out in Cleveland as they brought in a plethora of new corners, but he's just a year removed from a really good season where he got a nice new contract. Not really sure why Cleveland gave up on him so quick that he very well could have been the best corner in that room this year. So he's going to come in and plug in and be a very solid number two right away, playing opposite of Patrick Peterson, who still might be the best corner in football. So we'll see who ends up winning the nickel corner job left vacant by uh, the departure of Tyron Matthew. Could it be Christian Campbell? Certainly. Benet Ben Wickery, Brandon Williams, Rudy Ford, uh, kind of a safety corner hybrid could get in the mix there. So, you know, really not a lot of depth here. Very concerning. Uh, the theme for this entire defense is very poor depth and health is going to be very important. But some good corners, one through three, I think. Uh, you know, I am obviously higher on Christian Campbell. And then you've got a couple good safeties here on Antoine Bethea, just a solid veteran. Nothing special there. But then Buda Baker, second round rookie last year, who was honestly one of the better rookies in the entire league last year, should continue to grow. 
and near sort of that top 10, 15 versatile safeties in this league. So overall, defensively, they do rank 11th. That is assuming they can stay fully healthy because if you get injured at really any position, there is a significant drop off in talent and it could be very problematic and you know very hard to avoid injuries. So you know, perhaps gonna need a little bit of luck to sustain a really good defense here, but all the starters are in place to make this a very competitive Cardinals team. Then we do rank the coach and culture as well as we look at the overall grades here. You know, I, I still think this team has a very good culture. I was impressed by the fact that they were able to stay together and win eight games last year. This going back two, three years ago was one of the best cultures in football under Bruce Arians. And I think there are definitely remnants of that. I like the Wilkes signing. I think he's kind of a carryover of the Steve Kine and Bruce Arians mentality. It should be a pretty seamless transition and he plays better to their strengths as well as a defensive team. So they do come in 15th, tied with five other teams for coach and culture. So the last thing we gotta do here is look at this schedule. And honestly, for an NFC schedule, it's not so bad. So they start with uh, Washington, Chicago, and Seattle all at home. So I think they can start three and one. They do have some tough road games there. They got very much winnable games at home against Denver, uh, Oakland, Detroit. Projecting some optimism here, beating uh, San Francisco, Atlanta, and the Rams. So, you know, it's, it's certainly not an easy schedule, but for NFC standards, it could do a lot worse. Uh, but Vegas has this team's over under at five and a half, which I cannot understand because given everything this team went through, they still persevered and won eight games last year. And I, you know, I don't like taking that approach of, you know, applying a team's win total from last year, but I really do think, you know, you get David Johnson back, you've got much better quarterback play here if this defense can stay healthy should be a very good defense so I think they're going to play pretty much everyone pretty tough maybe I'm just too high on this team but I've got them winning nine games here I like the over now obviously that doesn't pay much right now so if that ever goes up to like six or six and a half and it would pay better you know maybe I consider that but overall Cardinals fans what are your expectations coming off of last season as we enter this new era for this Cardinals team. Interested as well to hear from non-Cardinals fans, considering I am much higher on this team, what you guys think of this ranking. So do let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, do hit that like button. Cheers as always, guys. We'll see you next time.